the second most abundant natural polymers and it can be used uh, in improve the sustainability of the plastics by decreasing the dependence to fossil-based materials. Uh, my name is Omid, Omid Hosseinai. I work as a researcher at Rice Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, I work on biomass valorization, bio-based material, especially lignin-based materials. So we work on different materials or different products from lignin. So what is needed is to modify lignin based on the target application. For example, if you want to make fuels or chemicals from lignin, other materials like thermoplastics or different carbons from lignin. We are at our laboratories at Drottning Kristina Sverg, where we modify lignin and we make coatings with it and coat paper and board with lignin. This is one of the wet spinning labs at RICE. Uh, here we develop fibers from uh, renewable sources, mainly from lignin and cellulose. The fibers can be used in several applications. For example, as a precursor for carbon fiber, uh, textile fiber development, and also fibers for biocomposites. So one area we work is the carbonized materials from lignin. And one application of the carbonized or material is using this material in energy storage application. I mean, you know that the, the demand for energy is growing and the need for the renewable sources or more efficient ways, for example, using batteries for the storing the energy is increasing. So here is the, this is the car that we, as a demonstrator, we, we made it. So in this car, we have different components made from lignin-based carbons. For example, the roof. Roof of this car is made from the lignin-based carbon from the melt spinning process. And also in this, this car, we have these uh, lithium-ion batteries. And these batteries are inside the car. And in these batteries, we use the lignin as anode electrode for the lithium-ion batteries. This is to show different uh, applications from lignin, both structural and non-structural, which is energy storage applications. My name is Erika Back, and I work as a research engineer here at RICE, uh, mainly with chemical analysis of uh, samples from the pulp and paper industry. One of our techniques uh, that is very useful is pyrolysis GCMS, in which the samples are heated rapidly to high temperatures in an inert environment. In that way, we can uh, identify the chemical structure of any organic material, such as lignin. Lignin is a fantastic material. It's beautiful. It's brown like chocolate, and it's full of functionality, so we can do a lot of uh, wonderful things. And we just need to be each day smarter about this. It's fantastic. So good afternoon, everyone, and very welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the film. If you want to see my colleagues again, uh, you can find it uh, on our webpage, lignocity.se, where you also can make a digital tour and uh, see the location. I work as a project manager at uh, Lignocity, and uh, today we present this webinar in the name of a project called Ligna Innovation. I have a good support in the background from Annika and Malin at Paper Province. They are a partner in this project as well as Kristinehamn Municipality. And it is a project financed by the help of the EU Structural Funds, um, Region Värmland and the project partners. And to have the best experience today, uh, we recommend you to use the speaker's view and uh, you can find the way to change views in your upper right corner. You can play around with it, then you will see the difference between speaker and gallery view. And uh, if you want to see the previous webinars we have sent, they are also available on lignocity.se, as well as this will be later on. And our speakers today, it is uh, Lars-Erik Sjögren from Biosorb and researcher Antje Potas from University of Natural Resources and Life Science in Vienna. 
and Lars Erik, you are first out. So very welcome uh, to you. And you are already sharing your presentation successfully. That is great. We see it perfectly well. And I hope that we hear you also. Yes, can you hear me? Is it OK? Yes, perfectly well. Welcome, Lars Erik. Please uh, tell, tell uh, us about uh, who you are and uh, then give us your presentation of Biosorb, which has made an exciting journey. Thank you, thank you, and I'm glad to be here today. And uh, I can see lots of friends here as well. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Lars Erik Sjögren, and uh, I'm the CEO since uh, five years, uh, since uh, three years ago for um, Biosorb. I have a background, I'm not a scientist at all. I have a background as an MBA from Anders Högskolan in Stockholm, and uh, I have mainly done my um, career in, uh, in, in the medical field and healthcare society, I, both uh, within companies as well as uh, head of um, uh, some parts of the oncology department at Karolinska. Uh, this is actually uh, my fifth uh, startup, uh, startup uh, either as the CEO or a CFO, or but in all cases, I've been owner or part owner from, from the companies. And uh, earlier on, I was uh, working with the uh, mainly, as I said, the medical industry. But since uh, three years ago, or put it four years ago, I have been entering the what we call wood tech. Uh, from a personal perspective, I'm 58 years old and uh, living in Stockholm uh, right now and uh, commuting into Värmland since at least two years ago. Uh, yes, what about uh, uh, Biosorb? Uh, yeah, we have developed a uh, bio-based absorbent, oil absorbent and the material since uh, Actually, it uh, started a long time ago, and I will tell you a little bit about the story. But the material we today have uh, uh, out actually in the market for, since a couple of weeks ago, it's uh, meant to, to uh, collect and absorb uh, oil and uh, grease and other hydrocarbons. Uh, the uh, features, the main features of the material is that we have a fantastic absorption uh, capability of uh, nine to 14 times its own weight, depending on viscosity of the, the oil or grease. We have even produced uh, materials that can take on more than 14 times, but this is where we are at our customer promise today. It's hydrophobic, antibacterial, antibacterial uh, which means that it's uh, floating on water and it's not uh, dissolving in, in the water, uh, which means that we can use it in the porch and in the water treatment and uh, for instance. On the right hand side, you can see a little bit of our uh, uh, applications and where, where we are today, uh, both in water and on land, uh, as uh, using as uh, oil booms or in uh, the industry or, or where we believe one transportation industry where we believe our main market will be. Yeah. Today's competitors for ours is uh, mainly concrete, cotton, plastics, and uh, as you probably know, all of those have uh, environmental issues when it comes to either energy, CO2, uh, car, uh, CO2 uh, emissions, or uh, usage of lots of water in, in the case of cotton. And therefore, we are very proud to be very uh, scarce or uh, even frugal on, on the uh, using uh, energy as well as uh, water and other chemicals in producing our uh, product. Uh, I was asked a little bit uh, today about uh, telling us about our story and uh, our journey towards the, from, from the lab laboratory up until uh, full-scale production. I would say it's a little bit uh, tricky to talk about full-scale production because we are still on the step and, uh, and uh, yeah, but we are out producing at least for, for the market right now. Uh, the background of the company, and uh, which is shown here, is that um, the company was founded in uh, 2013, almost the third, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the intention was to import and uh, sell microbes uh, consuming oil in, in different, uh, in, or remediating oil. Uh, Later on, that they, uh, the founders discovered that they needed the way of uh, carrier 
uh, some kind of carrier to carry out the, the oil, uh, to, uh, the, absor uh, the microbes out to the oil, but, and they turned to KTH in uh, Stockholm and uh, came in contact with the uh, wood chemistry department there with uh, Professor Monica Gayak, who actually earlier had uh, tried to, uh, early in 2005 to 2010, if I remember right, tried to do initial tests in uh, creating an antibacterial uh, material or forestry product, but it it became hydrophobic, so that was not what she was looking for. So she put it on the shelf. But uh, suddenly they discovered in the match in 2018 that this was perfect for for the intention of being the carrier. So today so uh, the the company uh, or the founders actually decided to throw the microbes overboard and uh, take along the the method of uh, that Monica had developed. Uh, myself came aboard three years ago when, when they were looking for a, a new money and uh, we, we made an um, ownership and management uh, switch during 2019-2020 and started to develop uh, the, the process further. In that, uh, uh, during that time as well, we had come in contact with Värmland, Rottnerus, and not the least uh, Pepe province in, in Konstad. So uh, it were, became natural that we were trying to uh, look into to ways of uh, doing the testing and to take it from laboratory up to uh, some kind of a pilot stage or a startup uh, cage where, where we did, uh, where we could do larger tests on the product. Which we actually did, and when we were sitting down during fall 2019, we decided that we had actually three important uh, questions that we wanted to have an answer on. And that was, may I, first of all, it was uh, to clarify the strategy, the IP strategy, and the applications, and the, that they were uh, actually protecting uh, the ideas of the company. This is an important one, but. Uh, uh, we, we did to have uh, to revise it together with the patent bureau, and uh, we, we did um, uh, another application or uh, submitted some uh, compli complementary uh, information. Secondly, uh, we did see that that had been produced uh, uh, less than a kilo in the laboratory uh, in KTH of the material, and and we did see a. a technical risk in scaling up to the next level. How to do it? Will, will the chemistry work on, on larger scale, et cetera? Uh, we did this and uh, we got the possibility of having uh, a location at the Rottenroos uh, mill in, in Sunne. And we borrowed their uh, in, uh, room, 300 square meters and set up a production process. And we did this manually at this, uh, and this was very important. It took us six months in order to get the process right. We got the right product, etc. And I still remember when, when we had the same results as we had in the laboratory, which I, I took us quite a long time in that sense. But what we learned during that time also was how the pulp, how the material were behaving, both in, in the, uh, uh, during the process, how long time it took, what kind of uh, uh, treatment we needed to give it, et cetera, et cetera. This was very important for our next uh, step afterwards. Thirdly, and uh, maybe as, uh, as important as the other ones, is, was to reduce and clarify the market risk. And how should we do that? Yeah, during the time when we were producing the two tons of pulp, we took it out to customers. We visited 25 to 30 customers during this time, and they tested the product, uh, and we got an understanding of what the customer needs actually were. Uh, and they, this, I, I believe that they, I have done this mistake early in my life, and it's to understand what is the really, what are the customer asking for, and to be close to the customer, and they. Even though we did it in 2019, we couldn't have done it even earlier on. And I continue to say, never stop meeting the customers. <clears throat> Let's see. 
like that. And this is some pictures from, from uh, our first uh, uh, first uh, uh, scale up situation. And th th it's uh, fun to show you and sharing this picture because it shows that we did everything manually. And even though uh, the, the upper left is uh, a way of trying to refine and open up the fibers, which we actually did with, with a uh, garden shimmer. And, and on, on the bottom left as well, we, we have our dry, which we're actually the third attempt to dry the product in an efficient way. And um, we, which we actually, I, this is a copy of, of the dry we are using still today, but it's done on, on a larger scale. And then uh, our first warehouse as well as on the way out to the customer on the bottom. After we have done this and uh, we, we have finished off the product of, or, or the piloting in February 2020, and uh, we, we had a decision in the, among, on, among the board and owners that we let's take the next step. step. So, and uh, we took the decision of uh, start looking for and uh, put up a wish, vision, which is uh, symbolized by the tent or, or by or on, on the right hand. But we needed a plant that, that could produce 500 tons per year. This is not a lot for you guys sitting listening to me, but for us it was a quite a big step to take. Uh, and we wanted to also to give it a uh, possibility of, of expanding the business up to 1500 tons. And uh, we made our calculations that we could make this profitable at, at those numbers, which was quite important because it's always tough when you need and depend on the owner's money. We had uh, to sit down and say, where should we do this? Of course, we had been at Rotten Roos and uh, we did a very critical decision-making process and were hesitant about the, if we're going to stay in Värmland. But uh, when we do our... Uh, 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 transparency uh, com uh, 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 compared it to other sites, we, we found out that Värmland is actually the best site it could be at. And I will come back to that later on here. And we also stayed at Rotten Roos because uh, they showed us, they had the know-how, they, they know the industry, they were, they have a big, uh, they have the right values corresponding to ours, and they have, have a great, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, goals to, to heading on the sustainability issues. And of course, we know that they were, uh, they had the pulp that worked for us, as well as uh, they had uh, the infrastructure on wastewater power supply, and uh, they could supply us also with the uh, low temperature heat water, which is necessary for our drying process. After we had taken that decision, it's uh, uh, during spring 2020, we also decided that we needed some money to build a plant. And uh, of course, this was very tough since it was the beginning of the pandemic. But we succeeded in uh, getting along 10 million sec uh, to, to take this step or securing even more because we get some uh, grants from, from the region. So I think we use approximately 30 million sec in, in that sense. And we, we started to, to uh, planning. We de decided that we needed uh, to hire some people. So we got on board uh, our R&D manager, Anneli, uh, on the picture down there. And uh, we had a production leader, uh, Sara, which is still head of our production plant up in Sunne. Today, I can regret that we didn't do this earlier. Uh, we should have brought along more people earlier. It cost, but it would have saved us some money. We also got back to the laboratory and learned more uh, how about the process to take it from the pilot to the, to the full-scale production, which was quite, uh, we did see that there were some issues in that step. We start planning. Uh, we, we took a board, uh, started to do some uh, planning with, with uh, AFRI, uh, which we choose uh, as our partner. Uh, and I quite soon found out that um, 
size ain't everything. And it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to come because the industry, the paper and pulp industry is so focused on getting the largest, uh, the biggest and the most cost efficient uh, equipment. So, so we have to find other, um, uh, other suppliers, other industries, uh, which was quite harsh in prior to the year. We, we did see the, where we could get it. We got lots of uh, ideas from the farming industry because they have smaller size. So we, we have quite a, quite a lot of that kind of equipment. Trying to keep our costs down, which meant that we had to, you know, to do the reuse of equipment and the uh, old uh, equipment. Uh, what we also found that it's important to listen to the industry. You, you People in the industry have lots of know-how, of course, and uh, but we also learned that it's important to challenge and ask why. And uh, yeah, probably one of the most important one also is never stop uh, trust trusting your gut feeling, but listen to facts. Of course. Here we have some, uh, on the bottom right, we have our present dryer. It's a little bit larger than the one we had earlier on, but it's still on the same principles. In the construction of the plant, we had to do some trade-offs, of course. And we decided to, to put uh, the plant in tent, which uh, you know, we have quite warm inside it. So we have the, the heat, so it, it's no problem during winter time. Reuse of equipment, as I mentioned earlier on. We decided also that we can't automize the process. We needed to have a, we need to have it semi manual in order to uh, learn more, still learning, that, that's important. And also that get our staff to understand how the material works during the process. Uh, with those money that we got and uh, spent and decided to spend, we, we couldn't have any redundancy systems. And that meant that we are dependent on Rotnero's heat supply. And uh, with those uh, energy prices we have had, that, that have been a little bit tricky one because uh, sometimes the industries are closing down for a couple of hours, and we, which means that we have no heat. But uh, we, we, that had been uh, successful. Or still, it had been working quite well. And of course, uh, with the semi manual system, it's caused lots of hands on from our staff. Um, what, uh, what insights have we got so far? Yeah, of course, we, we know we have learned quite a lot about the process and materials, which is good. Uh, the the semi manual or manual workload that we have hits the margins, but uh, still. Overall, it improves our know-how about the processes, which is uh, still important. Our total capex on, on the on the investment is uh, twenty-five percent above budget, but uh, I think we, we are okay on that. What we also learned is that the things that we had the ability to learn in the pilot uh, at Trotnerus is uh, the things that have been working or even in the full-scale production. But the things that we couldn't test or hadn't tested earlier on, we have had struggling with. And finally, I, I would say also having the right partners is giving us a tremendous uh, possibility because they have learned, learned us quite a lot about how to do things, even though they need to be challenged. And uh, finally, a couple of... Uh, 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 thoughts about the commercialization because this is quite an um, important one as well. We got our product, uh, product manager, Luis, on board during last summer, and as well as our salesman, Robert. Uh, as well as I said er uh, earlier, we, we got those people, uh, even though we hadn't the ready finished product, they were too late on board because it's important to. Being start working with the markets during the fall uh, uh, and the winter two, uh, 2020, we also get an agreement with the uh, Ekman Group in, in Gothenburg, which is one of the largest uh, trading houses on paper, independent trading houses on paper and pulp in place. Which means that we uh, quite early on got an uh, access to the global markets, and which means 
even though we are not yet out there since we are focusing on Scandinavia, but they give us uh, inspirations and they give us insight to what other markets are looking for. And that this is important. Things take time. Uh, yeah, and it's always difficult to start the commercialization process when we don't have the products in place. And, uh, but, but it's important to be out there and talk about us. And um, as I say, it's, uh, you can't start early enough. Uh, challenges and uh, possibilities. And th this is uh, my uh, second last line that uh, we think, uh, and that, that's my, my uh, thought is that when choosing partners, we are working with Ekman Group and with Jula, who's uh, one of our owners, Rotner Rose, AFRI. They're all large corporation. And you all quite often hear about the issues working with uh, between large and small corporation, but I think it's easier than I expected. And they are listening, and they, I find that quite interesting of the possibility of of exchanging ideas and uh, working together. Financing. Of course, we, we are dependent and have been dependent on, on getting money from uh, outside since we don't have any uh, uh, revenues to talk about yet. And it's always, to, to think of that, it's always easy. You have to have the right money and owners at the right time. It's easy to say, but you need grants and systems for grants in the beginning. But grants can steer you in the wrong, wrong agenda if you have in the wrong direction. Yeah, sorry for the misspelling there, but yeah, because they, they sometimes they, you they you need to fulfill goals and maybe don't those goals are not in the interest of the company or where, where you want to go and it's important to have that in mind. Equity, it's always like that. You need to have the right uh, owners and then uh, owners that believe in what you do. And uh, the same with, uh, we are in the process, we have uh, Almi as a, a co-supplier co of money today. And that, that, that's important because they give us insights to other uh, perspective as well. And uh, since a year ago, also we are working with the commercial banks, which is, uh, gives us uh, uh, means that we are bankable, which is important. Location, uh, I said that I'm uh, commuting from Stockholm and actually the, the company was first started in Stockholm, but uh, two years ago we decided that we moved the company from Stockholm to Värmland, from Eladalen to Värmland. And the, the, we have, the, this is one of the important things because in Värmland we get closeness to the industry as well as to, to uh, know how the, not least the networks of uh, Paper Province, the region, Sunne, municipality and rice, uh, of course, rice is in Stockholm, but you have uh, Lignus City and uh, in uh, Värmland as well. And uh, not least, uh, lots of uh, startup colleagues um, here, which uh, exchange ideas and uh, frustration together with, uh, sometimes we have a Tuesday club uh, meeting uh, one of the startup uh, colleagues uh, almost every Tuesday, which uh, gives uh, Lots of uh, things to to uh, to talk about. Pandemia, of course, it has been hampering, but today I think it has created more opportunities, in a sense that we have uh, having uh, the possibility of getting out, and we we have been also uh, when things have opened up uh, from time to time, people have been. Uh, Yes, uh, curious to meet us, which is uh, have been good, good ways, or good, good for us. Yeah, I actually have mentioned all those, so uh, I think I'll stop sharing here. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Lars Erik, uh, and uh, many good advices to to other startups, I would say. Mm. And and if they want to. To have a dialogue around that, we are happy to to do so. Uh, if there are specific questions from anyone, please type them down in the chat. You find it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so write any questions there. And also afterwards, we will uh, run uh, the recording till three o'clock. And if anyone wants to stay after that, 
uh, then we encourage you to do so and have some small talking after that. Um, Lars-Erik, do you have a, a specific number one advice to any startups within the bioeconomy that you would like to give? I, I come back to, to what I said earlier on. With, with the, the try to be close to your customers and try to reduce market and technical risk as early as possible. Live with that. I, that that would be the most important one. Very good. Yeah. And uh, with that said, we would like to welcome our second speaker, that is Ancha. Hi. Uh, oh, good good nice to see you. <laughs> and uh, I've seen on the participants that we have. Uh, uh, friends from many different countries here today, which is uh, great. And uh, I repeat again that if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we will answer to as many as possible uh, within the, the hour we have. And afterwards we stay for a short talk, everyone who wants. But Amche, please introduce yourself and uh, let us know more about molar mass of lignin. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone from Vienna. Um, my name is Antje Potast. I'm a wood chemist by training, and I'm a professor at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences. Um, in German, it's Bodenkultur. That's why we are referred to as uh, Boku. Um, so I work in, in molar mass analysis um, since quite a while. Started off actually with cellulose, um, but in the last 10 years also we looked a little bit into lignin. And this is basically what I would like to talk today um, to you. What is the motivation actually here? Um, what, what I find puzzling um, is a little bit, um, I would like to know the molar mass of a lignin molecule in a tree. Um, that is something which is, of course, a very academic question, and we can argue whether we need to know that or if, if it gives us any benefit. Um, I would say at the moment we can't answer that um, because we have no choice to really get the lignin out without changing uh, the molar mass or possibly changing the molar mass. So that is something which is maybe a little bit um, further ahead. But of course, what we need and what we want is um, that we measure the molar mass of technical lignans. Um, we have a pretty decent understanding of um, the structure of native lignin um, in different plants, especially in wood. So thanks to the works of, of Ralph and, and colleagues here. Um, but whatever type of pulping um, we do, we change the molar mass um, and we change the structure of that lignin to quite a bit. To a large extent, and craft pulping is is one way of pulping, of course, and the, the change in the lignin structure is, is quite severe. Um, <clears throat> we know a lot about it. On the other side, we still don't know a lot about it, so we are still working on that. But we want to know um, the molar mass because that is an important parameter of a polymer, um, and that is not a very academic question because here now we can relate the uh, parameter of molar mass um, also to applications. And here it becomes important. And uh, as lignin is a polymer, it will influence our um, applications and how lignin behaves in applications. So from that point of view, it's, it's really important. The question is, do we really need absolute numbers? Because we can have a relative molar mass relative to standards. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really have lignin standards, so we can relate it to polystyrene, polystyrene sulfonate. Um, and we get some, some relative numbers, uh, but we also, and I will show you a little bit about this later, have the chance to measure some absolute numbers. Do we need that? Um, not always, of course. Um, in most cases, it's quite okay if we just have the relative numbers because we just need information how does the lignin change in, in some processing we do or in some modification? But sometimes it's good to have absolute numbers. And we know that, um, especially also from the cellulose case, and especially when we want to try to compare lignins um, in different labs, it's good to have this um, more absolute means of uh, measurement. So here it, it might come in handy to have absolute numbers. Now, one thing I, I want to briefly um, discuss here 
is that we have to understand that lignin is a very, very dispersed molecule. Now, most biopolymers and um, most polysaccharides um, are um, dispersed. Um, just a protein basically is not dispersed. What, what does it mean? We have a mixture of different chain length or different um, molar sizes um, in our polymer. So we have a broad distribution of molar masses. So this is the case for cellulose, for instance, as an example. So we have different chain lengths. So the cellulose is rather simple in that respect. Um, when we compare it to lignin, because lignin is not only dispersed with regard to chain length, but it's also dispersed within um, this molar mass distribution with regard to, for instance, branching. That means if we slice up our molecule um, in different fractions, and if we do that very narrowly, just in case we were able to do that, we would see a different composition of functional groups probably in, in that single fractions. Um, we would see different connectivities in here. We would see a different nature of the end groups. Um, we would see different sulfonic acid groups if we would have a lignosulfonate. Um, if we take it very roughly, we can say, okay, in the rather low molar mass area, as we have it here, we have also impurities in, with regard to extractives in the high molar mass area, we may have lign um, hemicellulosis. So we have um, a rather dispersed molecule and this makes it sometimes a little bit more complicated compared to a classical neat uh, polymer like polystyrene or polyethylene or something like this. So this is just, this is some sort of understanding we should basically have when we look at lignin. Now, when it comes to the measurement, um, it, um, we have to keep in mind, what do we need? Do we just want to um, measure graft lignin or do we have also lignosulfonates and organosulf lignins? So do we need a unique method for all of them? That's um, possible, um, but may not be necessary. Um, so this is a little bit um, background we need to know before we start. Uh, because especially lignosulfonates, most of them are water soluble and craft lignins, they are behaving very differently. Um, and of course, quite often, before we can even start with lignin, um, sometimes we don't have lignin, we just may have a black liquor and we have to isolate and purify that lignin out of that black liquor. And um, that is also important. So because this may also influence um, our final product, um, this may influence the purity, um, the side products, and that usually has a large influence also in analytics. So um, just also please pay attention to your isolation and purification step, which is sometimes also very tedious um, for lignans. Now, when we go to the actual measurements, if you want to measure molar mass distribution of lignans, we have a lot of um, methods in the literature. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. So we actually can choose from a, a real set of methods, which, which is really nice. And I don't have a specific preference for, for a single method. It really depends what is available in the lab, what is the question uh, you want to answer with the molar mass distribution. Um, do you maybe uh, prefer a derivatization? And this is what we have here on the left side. So we can derivatize our lignin. And then it usually becomes soluble in organic solvents. Um, the handling is, is rather easy. We just have this derivatization step, which may take some time. Um, you can do acetylation, acetopromination, and so on. It's more difficult for lignosulfonates, though. So for them, this wouldn't work. Um, we can go straight and can say, OK, um, we can directly dissolve it in an aqueous solvent like um, alkaline. Um, because we need some alkalinity to dissolve craft lignans. Here we don't have um, derivatization uh, to do. It's rather universal. It works for most lignans. Just the sodium hydroxide is a little bit harder on your hardware. Um, so that um, may um, have some effects maybe on your lifetime of your machinery. Um, what, what I like, um, coming basically from, from the cellulose side 
is an organic solvent with a salt, uh, which can directly dissolve um, the material. So we go away from the derivatization need, um, unless you otherwise have any way of derivatization to do. Um, and this is in a way universal uh, because we can run uh, lignosulfonates together um, with or, or in the same system compared, uh, together with craft lignans and organosulf lignans. And it has some advantages also if we further apply light scattering to get absolute numbers. Now, usually um, our system, which we use, is a DMSO lesion bromide system. It's, it's well described in the literature. It's also nothing we developed um, per se. Um, we just developed a little bit further with regard to measuring of, of uh, lignosulfonates. Um, for good resolution, we usually couple three columns in a row and we have run times which are around one hour. So this, this is pretty long. And um, we were thinking whether, how can we add some speed um, to this uh, rather lengthy method? Because if you have many samples and you uh, do double, triple determination, then um, it's, it's a lot of time and a lot of LU and um, what you need. And if you wanna add some speed to a chromatography method, um, uh, you have basically go up with the pressure as well. And as you all know, a classical gel column doesn't take a lot of pressure. So per column, you have around 20 bars, and this is about it. Um, so we need to change basically the stationary phase if we want to um, change the system to a faster method. And a couple of years ago, um, um, BEH or uh, particle material became available, which is basically, um, a solid state, um, very mechanically a stable particle. So the solvent um, can also be changed in this column, something you should not do um, with a gel column. So especially if you have a high swelling solvent like DMSO. Um, so that is totally different in, in that case. So you can switch between solvents because you have no swollen state. Um, and what is, what is most important here, you can go up to 1,200 bar of pressure. So it's a totally different system. Um, and the, um, the range of, of size you can separate here did really fit the, um, the lignin case. So we tried that out and um, checked whether that would be something where we can also separate uh, lignin molecules. And it indeed works. So we use our um, DMSO system. Um, we have about 500 bar pressure. That's, that's really a lot. Um, and if you would only use DMSO um, and no lesion bromide, um, the uh, pump would stop because the DMSO would freeze out in the pump head. But adding the lesion bromide, which we anyway need in a system, um, causes basically a freezing point depression. And um, this keeps the solvent liquid um, until about 600 bar pressure. Um, and you can really run it um, here. It's more easy if you can just use THF. So if you have any way derivatized um, lignans or organosolved lignans, you can run them directly in THF and you don't run into a pressure issues with um, like compared to DMSO. Um, it's, it's stable. And you see here in the in top right um, that the runtime is rather short. So for a craft lignin, we have a runtime of about 6.5 minutes. So we cut it down from 65 minutes to 6.5 minutes. For the lignosulfonates, we combine basically all four available columns, um, which are from 45 angstrom to 450 angstrom. And we have run times of about nine minutes for lignosulfonates, but you can run, run them on um, the very same system. So you have a huge gain in analysis speed and um, you have a very good resolution. And um, if you compare it directly, you see it here, the characteristics of the separation is, is very similar to the classical gel column. So we don't have big changes rather than, or just that we really have this, this gain in runtime. And as I said, it works um, for a lot of different lignans. So this is the APC, Advanced Polymer Chromatography. 
So that could be an option if you look into um, a speed system. Now let's talk about this absolute molar mass um, detection. Um, there are only a few methods where you can measure absolute numbers for, for molar mass, and one is light scattering. Uh, I don't want to go into theory here. Um, I just um, want to show you uh, the application of light scattering. Um, so basically what we use here is that we measure the intensity of the scattered light when the light um, passes basically through a cell with our sample and the polymer molecules interact with that light, scatter that light and based on different theories like uh, finally sim equation or Debye equation, we can calculate in absolute way the molar mass um, of this material. And the only parameter we need is the refractive index increment. I don't want to go into that. Um, I just want to show you the lignin kicks. Now, the, the light scattering systems, which are on the market, and they are used for a wide variety of polymers, and we use it, for instance, for polysaccharides, um, usually work with a red laser, uh, which is around 660 nanometers. And um, we tested that by taking a lignin um, or different fractions of a lignin um, we had separated before um, with ultrafiltration. So you see here clearly classical SEC, this is the big molecules, these are the small molecules, so they have definitely uh, different molar mass, these different fractions. So the cutoffs of the membranes were from, from 100 kilodalton to 1 kilodalton, so really, really different um, molar masses in these fractions. And if we apply that light scattering, and you see basically the data here for that light scattering, um, we see two things. First of all, um, we see across um, this different fractions, if you just choose like the red fraction, um, we see basically a monodispersity. So all the molecules in this fraction um, have more or less the same molar mass somewhere here around um, 50,000 grams per mole. And this is the same is true also for the low molar mass um, fraction has basically the same um, molar mass and it's similar across the peak. And we all know that even if you have a pre-separation here, lignin is dispersed. So there is definitely not a monodispersed peak here. So we see from that, um, um, light scattering signal that something is wrong here because all those um, fractions more or less have the same molar mass. So what happens here is basically um, that we see a light scattering signal, but this light scattering is induced by fluorescence because our craft lignin, everyone knows it's, it's dark brown and um, shows a lot of fluorescence. So we shine with our laser light onto that sample and, and the sample shows a strong fluorescence and this fluorescence we measure. So the photodiodes around this measuring cell, they don't catch the light, which is coming from scattering by the molecules. Um, it's coming from the fluorescence of the molecule. And this is larger, um, more intense, uh, and gives us totally wrong information about the molar mass. And unfortunately, there is literature where you have fancy numbers of um, lignin molar masses uh, which are all way too high, and the reason is this autofluorescence or the fluorescence. Um, so there are a couple of possibilities what you can do. You can use filters. Um, usually these are edge filters, and these filters have been applied here, but an edge filter just covers the edges, but plus minus 10 nanometer uh, in the measurement range, it's open. And so the edge filter does not really help here. And another uh, approach is that you go away um, and go to higher wavelengths. And this is basically um, possible. Um, okay, so we have here the fluorescence. Um, and then we go to higher wavelengths and we use an infrared laser at 785 nanometer. Um, this laser you can't see anymore, it's a bit hard to adjust. Um, but now all of a sudden, um, the light scattering data make more sense because we see the dispersity. We see that across the peak, although this is a fraction, um, the molar mass changes. And um, we still have a little bit too high numbers here, but it's, it's in the right range. 
So that looked um, at the first glance very good. Said, oh wow, it it works. So we have just to go to this um, 800 nanometer IR laser, and we can measure it. Unfortunately, it's still not correct for our craft lignin. Um, because we have to consider another problem. Um, we not just have fluorescence with lignin, we also have absorption. So in light scattering, you must not have fluorescence and you must not have absorption. Um, absorption is basically the other direction. Here, light is basically swallowed um, by the cell or by the material. Um, and I've shown you here um, an example, um, Mildwood lignin. Um, very nice material to work with when you do light scattering because you have no fluorescence, especially not at 785 nanometers. Um, we see here the RI signal, we see here in green, the UV signal. And here we see the laser forward monitor. So this is the, the monitor. So this is a sensor basically, which measures the light coming through um, after the measuring cell. And we see here, we have a flat, um, line, that's perfectly fine. So no problem with Milbud lignin. Now, if you look at this for craft lignin, we again have here in blue the RI signal, the concentration, UV concentration, everything good. We see the right um, distribution. And the forward laser monitor now shows us that, it shows us that there's light swallowed here in, in the range of, of our lignin. And this needs to be corrected for because this gives us also um, wrong data. And this is one reason why we see such a nice curve because it counteracts our fluorescence. So if um, we try to correct for that, um, we basically reference not against the, the pure laser light, but we reference against the forward monitor, which takes into account the light which has been absorbed by the sample. Um, this is possible in, in some light scattering devices. And um, for a sample uh, which has no absorption problem, uh, we get basically the same numbers uh, and the same data for the forward laser monitor as a reference and for the normal laser monitor. So we see that here for the Mildwood lignin. So, um, both uh, data basically overlay each other, so there is no problem. We measure basically the same. For lignin, uh, for craft lignin, um, we see that when we now correct this absorbance, um, we see that all of a sudden um, we get again here, you see the blue uh, curve, um, some fluorescence popping up. So actually, we should have here like in a red curve, an extension of what we see here in the high molar mass region, but we don't have that here. So um, there is still some residual fluorescence in this um, 800 nanometer um, light scattering. That means um, we cannot um, use this data here to measure our molar mass because this has been influenced by fluorescence. But what we can do and what is kind of nice, especially if we have a set of linear columns, we can use basically an extrapolation from the high molar mass region because you see here, um, the two laser monitors overlay each other. So there's no interference and we can extrapolate down. So it's not perfectly fine, but um, we largely minimize the error and we get now to um, more absolute numbers um, for our molar mass. Okay, so here again, Mildwood lignin and Kraft lignin extrapolated down. So we can measure with light scattering and an IR laser um, absolute numbers um, for Kraft lignin. And most other lignans behave a lot better than craft lignin. So craft lignin is the worst case scenario, basically, when it comes to lignin. So what we have now is basically we have a quick method, or speed method. We have an absolute method for for this um, for for the absolute numbers. Um, but where do we go from here? We need to go beyond that approach because what we measure so far are just classical parameters. So the speed method doesn't give us any, any information beyond just the molar mass. The light scattering gives us 
um, better data in terms of when it comes to absolute numbers, still we don't go beyond what we um, basically have so far measured. So now if we want to go beyond, um, we basically need a second dimension. And this is, um, uh, what, is what is next. I've just brought here um, one recent example from, from our group. Um, this is for lignosulfonates. Um, the reason is because we have less problems with solubility here. And we combine hydrophobic interaction chromatography um, together with SEC. And um, we add here a second dimension, which is hydrophilicity, basically. Um, and we can correlate that to, um, for instance, um, sulfonic acid groups. So um, in the future, um, I think we will see more of that because this gives us real um, more information now than just molar mass. And another example is given here. This is now the, um, the online version. So this is a real two-dimensional um, um, sex system, again, combined with HIC. And uh, all of a sudden, we um, see a lot more details um, in this lignosulfonates. And uh, the next step would be to do something similar also for craft lignans. But um, that, that is a lot more difficult. So we are really not there yet. Um, with that, I'm at the end. I would really like to thank um, all the people involved here, um, especially Ira, Oliver, Stefan, Ivan, uh, Krisha. Uh, Dr. Jana Falkenhagen from BAM in Berlin, which helped us a lot with two-dimensional systems and also Samira and also um, our partners from industry who um, helped us to develop um, and supported us basically. And um, I thank you for your kind attention and um, it would be nice if we can discuss a little bit. Thank you very much, Antje, for your presentation. Very interesting. And uh, there have... Uh, been written several questions in the chat that we will not have time to take within the, the hour. Uh, we can continue discussion uh, with, the, with the time after, as I said. I will forward the questions to you and, and I kindly ask you to, to write short answers and then I will send it out to everyone who has uh, uh, registered for this event and they will drop that with the link to the recording afterwards so everyone can enjoy the answers. I hope that is fair enough. And um, the next uh, webinar will be on the 19th of May. So you can already save the date in your calendar and an invitation will follow. Mm -hmm.